the delta pectoral approach. First, I'll discuss the anatomy relevant to this approach. We've got the deltoid muscle, pectoralis major, and the two heads of biceps coming underneath the tendon of pectoralis major. Deep to that, we've got the pec minor, coracobrachialis, the short head of biceps, and the long head of biceps. Subscapularis sweeps anteriorly to attach onto the lesser tuberosity, and below that, we've got the insertion of latissimus dorsi. There are no real cutaneous nerves that you need to worry about in the delta pectoral approach, and most of the nervous concerns are related to the brachial plexus, and they sit deeper to uh, most of the muscles. That's just the idea where uh, structures medial to the conjoint tendon, medial to coracoid, medial to short head of biceps, are the suicide, because that's where all the vessels and all the nerves are. And lateral to the lateral edge of uh, the short head of biceps is the safe side. All the nerves are defined in their relationship to the artery, and we have got the lateral cord, the posterior cord, and the medial cord. And the lateral cord gives its branches first to the muscular cutaneous nerve, and then the lateral branch to the median nerve. The posterior cord gives off the auxiliary nerve, and then the radial nerve. And the medial cord gives the medial branch to the median nerve, and then the final terminal branch, which is the ulnar nerve. And it's this lateral cord, which is mostly, and its branches, which are most commonly injured in the delta pectoral approach. After that, it's the posterior cord and its branches, auxiliary nerve and radial nerve. It's very seldom that you injure the structures of the medial cord, possibly the ulnar nerve, but that normally gets injured at the elbow, as we see here in this paper published in 2017. And it's muscular cutaneous nerve and median nerve, and it's probably at parts of that junction where that lateral cord is dividing into those two terminal branches. An uncommonly injured nerve, but if you're not careful, you can injure it, is the lower subscapular nerve. And it sits about five to six centimeters medial to the lateral border of uh, the short head of biceps. And you can injure that when you're sweeping under the conjoint tendon to be able to go find the auxiliary nerve. And so don't go too far medially. It generally sits around five centimeters medial to the lateral border. <clears throat> it's unusual to injure the radial nerve for primary procedures around the shoulder, uh, fixation of the proximal humerus joint replacement surgery, but you can damage it if you're doing revision surgery, particularly if you're going further down the shaft. And a nice reliable way of finding it on the medial board of the uh, shaft of the humerus is to remember that it sits about two and a half centimeters, or the minimum distance is two and a half centimeters, distal to the lower border of uh, latissimus dorsi. As for the vessels, the Cephalic vein defines the delta pectoral groove, but there are other vessels that are important in this area. We have the chromial branch of the thoracochromial artery, which goes into the CA ligament. We've got the deltoid branch or the humeral branch, which crosses across your path. You've got the anterior circumflex humeral artery and vein and the posterior circumflex humeral artery and vein. Now the cephalic vein, traditionalists would take the cephalic vein lateral. And that's because it drains deltoid and they're more venous branches lateral. Um, but it's not 100%. There's still branches medial as well. But you also need to bear in mind this artery, the deltoid branch of the thoracochromial artery, and it comes in two different forms. Um, there's a branch which comes across under the cephalic vein and then goes into deltoid, and that's quite easily dealt with when you see it as a discrete uh, neuro, neuro, not neuro, vascular bundle. You can tie that off or cauterize it. I normally just cauterize it. But there's another variation where it will come behind the back of the cephalic vein, travel down the cephalic vein, and then continually supply branches to the pectoralis major. And so if you're taking your cephalic vein lateral, you often come into a little bit of conflict with these vessels. And so for me, it's a 50-50 ball if you take it lateral or if you take it medial. I take it medial because often when I take it lateral, at the end of the procedure, I've injured it and normally have to tie it off anyway. The last vessel that you need to worry about is the terminal branch of the posterior circumflex humeral artery. So the posterior circumflex humeral artery is winding around the back of the neck, and then where it re-enters the humerus, that's where you injure it. When you put your retractor between deltoid and the humeral uh, shaft, and you retract, sometimes you'll see a, just a blush of uh, blood coming, and you know that's that terminal extension of that posterior circumflex humeral artery, and when you see it, you can cauterize it. As far as the ligaments go, we've got the biceps running in the bicipital groove. We've got the subcoracoid space, 
you've got the subacromial space, which isn't always in continuity with the subdeltoid space, but you need to define that space and get into that space. You've got the transverse ligament, keeping biceps in place, and the coracohumeral ligament. Now, in some patients, this is very flimsy, and it doesn't really stop you getting through into that subacromial space. But if you're taking on a proximal humerus that's two or three weeks old, you'll find that that ligament thickens up, and you need to discreetly divide that ligament. I'll often divide the coracochromial ligament, and then you get again that blush of blood, and you know where that blood's coming from. It's coming from the chromial branch of the thoracochromial artery. <clears throat> it seldom would come into conflict with the AC joint or with the conoid and trapezoid ligaments, the CC ligaments, in the delta pectoral approach. We have the capsule, the superior glenohumeral ligament, middle glenohumeral ligament, and inferior glenohumeral ligament for uh, completeness. The humeral head and shaft, <clears throat> the scapula with the glenoid and the chromium and coracoid, and then the lateral part of the clavicle. As far as position goes, most people will do a beach chair position or modified beach chair position when they're doing a delta pectoral approach. The important things there to bear in mind is the position of the head. You don't want it too extended. You don't want it too flexed. And you certainly don't want it laterally flexed. You want to make sure that your head is nice and neutral and the patient is comfortable sitting in the, the chair. We'll often take away the back piece so that you can get the elbow into extension if you need to instrument the medullary, cavity, medullary canal. If you're doing an intramedullary nail or if you're doing an arthroplasty and you need to uh, instrument the canal, uh, make sure that the arm is free so that it can go into uh, uh, extension. As far as intraoperative fluoroscopy goes, there's two options. One coming from the top of the bed like that and the other option is coming from the opposite side. I personally prefer that one where it comes from the opposite side. And once you've got your image intensifier in, you need to match it so that it's perpendicular to your humeral shaft. And then you need to match it to the scapula. Remember that the glenoid sits 90 degrees to the scapula, but the scapula sits 30 degrees to the chest wall. And so you need to move your eye so you get a tangential view, as seen above, of your glenohumeral joint. And that generally means angling it back. If you come from the opposite side of the table, pulling it back 30 degrees, so it matches the glenohumeral joint. As far as your skin incision goes, it really depends on what you're hoping to do. So if you're doing fracture surgery or joint replacement surgery, you generally need to get to the humeral shaft. And as such, you'll pick a more lateral incision. And most times my incision starts a lateral to the coracoid. And that's where you're making your incision. That's where it brings you down to. If you're doing glenohumeral instability work, that's when you want to work really on the glenohumeral joint, and so you want to be more medial. That's where you can make the vertical incision, where you can hide it in the auxiliary fold. And that's where it'll bring you down straight onto, onto the glenohumeral joint. It's important to bear in mind that the cephalic vein is a long way medial to the coracoid. So when you're struggling to find your cephalic vein and you're still lateral to the coracoid, it's because you're not medial enough. That just outlines the greater tuberosity. And if your incision starts laterally, and is laterally based, then once you've gone through your skin and subcutaneous fascia, you're down to the muscle layer, you know the cephalic vein is medial. The cephalic vein defines the delta pectoral groove and is absent in about 5% of cases. As I said before, I take it medial, um, but the traditionists would take it lateral. I think it really is a 50-50 ball. And you're utilizing the internervous plane between deltoid, which is supplied by the auxiliary nerve, pectoralis major, which is supplied by the medial and lateral pectoralis ne pectoral nerves, and biceps, which is supplied by the muscular cutaneous nerve. Once you've got through your delta pectoral groove and you've moved deltoid to the side and pec major medially, you then get down to the conjoint tendon. And we know that the lateral side is the safe side and the medial side is the suicide. And so we generally incise the fascia uh, lateral to the conjoint tendon, bearing in mind that uh, the coracohumeral ligament in some people may be discrete, in some people it's just a little bit of thickening of the fascia, you'll divide that and then you'd get yourself into the subacromial space, work your finger around into the subdeltoid space, come around underneath the CA ligament into your uh, subcoracoid space, into the bursa above sap scapularis and possibly feel inferiorly where your posterior circumflex humeral vessels are and where your auxiliary nerve is. Remember and watch out for the lower subscapular nerve. Don't go too far medially. As for tendon of pectoralis major, it's very seldom that I incise it. If you need more access, you can incise up a third, two thirds of a pec major as long as you repair it. We 
in this line diagram, you'll see that the anterior circumflex humeral vessels are two. They're normally three sisters. There's normally two veins and the artery. Um, in formally approach it, if you think you're gonna have to go far that distal, generally for primary arthroplasty, I don't need to get down to the three sisters. Um, and so I only deal with them if I need to. There are some people who will go out there right from the start and uh, deal with them, either cauterizing them or tying them off. You get that blush of blood from the thoracochromal artery, and I've already talked about the deltoid artery. Remember the posterior circumflex humeral artery, which is coming back and inserting into the humerus that you may damage or tear, another source of bleeding. Once you've got through that level, you're then coming down to find your rotator interval. And the rotator interval is the interval between supraspinatus and subscapularis. And you don't normally see that, you feel that. If you put your finger into the, the gap, just lateral to the coracoid, you can feel the rolled edge of subscapularis. And you can then run either along the upper border of subscapularis or a little bit higher if you come all the way around and follow it round into the biceps tendon or the bicipital groove. Um, and that's where you're finding it between supraspinatus and subscapularis. Often releasing the coracochromial ligament gives you a lot more access to feel that uh, rotate interval if you're struggling. When you get down to this level, you've got a couple of options now. You can uh, leave biceps where it is, but then you don't want to destabilize it. Um, if you do come into the biceps groove and release the transverse uh, ligament, then you do need to do something with biceps, either just simple tenotomy or tenotomy and tenodesis. And what I'll often do is tenodes it to the soft tissues around subscapularis and into the greater tuberosity. To deal with subscapularis, you've got three options. You've got the tenotomy, cutting it half a centimeter or a centimeter medial to where it inserts onto the lesser tuberosity. You've got the subscapularis peel, where you come along the superior border of subscapularis in the rotator interval, into the bicipital groove, come down the bicipital groove and follow it around, and then you peel all of the fascia of subscapularis off the lesser tuberosity and take it medially. And your last option is the lesser tuberosity osteotomy. It's really a 50-50 ball on all three. Well, in fact, 33-33 on whether you do a tenotomy, a peel, or a lesser tuberosity osteotomy. If I have to do something where I'm going to put a shaft down the humerus, for example, a reverse with a stem or an anatomic with a stem, then I'll do a lesser tuberosity osteotomy because I do believe bone-on-bone -bone healing is better. You can also then see if your anterior structure has escaped. On an x-ray, you see the little lesser tuberosity migrate. Um, if I'm doing a stemless and I want the cup, the metaphysis to remain intact, then I'll do a subscapularis peel. But there's uh, no one has shown one to be superior over another in terms of outcome. As for extension, the delta pectoral approach goes beautifully into the anterolateral approach to the humerus. And that's another reason why I take the cephalic vein medial. Because if I start off delta pectoral, I can follow it around into the uh, humerus and take my uh, biceps and cephalic vein medial. You then move biceps medial, find the muscular cutaneous nerve, and you can simply split brachialis in the middle line uh, between its two uh, nerve structures. Watch out for the radial nerve. If you're not careful when you're doing that and the arm is in some internal rotation, you can sort of cross the path of the radial nerve. Make sure that you've got the arm pointing forwards so that you're splitting brachialis in its midline not letting the arm twist sideways like that and coming down onto radial nerve. So in summary, positioning is often beach chair position and pay a lot of attention to the head. Make sure that the patient is sitting there comfortably before you start your procedure. Intraoperative imaging, I like the image intensifier to come from the opposite side. I'll make it perpendicular to my humerus and then I correct for the version of the scapula on the chest wall by pulling the eye back 30 degrees. I make my skin incision <coughs> different depending on what I'm hoping to do. And I do it generally laterally so that I know my cephalic vein is medial. When I find the cephalic vein, I keep the cephalic vein on pectoralis major for a number of reasons. I then find the rotator interval, come around the rotator interval and lift subscapularis often with the subscapularis peel for me. No difference in terms of outcome of what you uh, do. And my extension of the delta pectoral approach is the extension into the humerus, into the anterolateral humerus. Thank you for your attention.